So without uh, further ado, it's with great pleasure to introduce you to Susie Quattro. Take it away, Susie. How you doing? How you doing, everybody who is ever there? Nice to be here. And uh, I guess what I was going to do was for my little sort of opening speech, if that's okay. And can I start now? Sure, absolutely. Take it away. I'm going to just take you, you know, through my life. So you know how I got into this business, how I happened to be and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so born in Detroit, uh, June 3rd, 1950. Three sisters and a brother. That's everybody always wants to know is Quattro, Susie Quattro, my middle name. Yes, it is. Because it sounds like a stage name and it's not. My mother was Hungarian. My father was Italian. Um, two generations ago, it was Michael Quattrochi. And he immigrated at the age of nine and at Ellis Island, they took one look at his name, chopped it off, and he became American Mike Quattro, as they did with lots of people's names. Anyway, so I'm in, I'm in Detroit, um, three sisters, one brother, and my father works in the automobile industry in the daytime. And in the evening, he plays music. So we, all of us kids in the family, we grew up in a really, really, really musical household. We had, I'm trying to remember now, in that house, we had two, two pianos, one full, one uh, upright. We had a harp, not this kind, a harp. We had uh, an electric mandolin, which hangs on my wall, banjo. Um, the accordion, he had, he played strolling accordion, my daddy's mainly keyboards. And he played strolling accordion. And a lot of people don't know this. He had a special accordion made that had a button. And you pushed it and it went to the French tuning. I see. A little bit of trivia, which is not even a semitone or buff, but it's just tweaked. And when you get that French accordion sound, that's why it sounds like that. And he also had a bass. Hello. So anyway, um, let's go to my light bulb moments that led me to being who I am. Five and a half was my first light bulb. And when I tell this story, it amazes me because this is exactly how it happened. There was a show in America called The Ed Sullivan Show. And it, it was a variety show, very famous show, actually. And uh, it was Sunday night, family sits down, they watch the variety show. And he had something for everybody, you know, uh, elephants, puppets, comedians, actresses, you know. And at the end, he would always say, no, something for the youngsters. And he'd bring out poppy something poppy and this not in five and a half remember and out comes elvis presley yeah. and he's singing uh don't be cruel so i was distracted because my older sister by nine years so she's 14 and a half she starts to scream huh? I'm, only, I'm only five and a half so i'm going what's the matter with you you know i don't get it and then i looked at the tv and i went zooming into it and at five and a half, I said to myself, I'm going to do that. No, no indication of gender didn't come into my mind. Just I'm going to do that. That stayed with me my whole life. Um, then at seven, I begged my dad for some bongo drums. That was what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a beatnik, having a cigarette hanging out my mouth and playing the bongos and reciting poetry. You have no idea. All right, so I, I got my bongo drums and then um, I have to sort of do the scenario for you uh, because it was a musical family. My father played music, even though it wasn't professional, semi-pro. And uh, we had family shows, I like to call them. So it could be Thanksgiving, Easter, Christmas, what didn't matter what it was, everybody either as a group or by themselves <clears throat> would get up and do a song, a sketch, play the piano, do a dance, whatever. And uh, I, at that young age, from like seven, eight, nine, ten, right around there, and every family show, I did something different. And sometimes I told a joke, and I was very funny. Actually, I actually could have gone into comedy, acting, writing, dancing, singing. What I could have gone into any of these arts, you know, arts. And what I noticed, which I'm leading up to how I became me, like... It, it dawned on me in the family shows that no matter who was doing what, when I did whatever I did for that particular show, everybody stopped and went, so what you get as a young child, without knowing it, you something goes in your brain that you can hold 
an audience and it starts to become part of your character that you that you develop as you go along. So I knew it very young that whatever I did, it seemed to hold people. So that's how I developed my craft. Then I'm going to fast forward it. I took um, percussion. I read and write percussion. I read and write and play piano. I took classical piano and percussion. I was in the orchestra and I got to be first chair in the percussion because I beat all the boys. <laughs> Sorry, I just have to pause there and say, how typical is that? Uh, then at 14, same show, Ed Sullivan show, the Beatles came out. Same, same kind of flashbulb moment. And my sister next to me in age, Patty, the one just three years older, we were running to the phones and we called our two friends and um, another girl got on the phone too, all neighborhood. And we were all wooing and yang about the Beatles. And my sister said, how about we start an all girl band? So everybody thought that was a terrific idea. Um, and to be honest, so I didn't really do gender with Elvis and I didn't do gender then. I just thought it would be cool to be in a band, but everybody picked an instrument and I already played drums and piano, but somebody else picked them and I didn't speak up, which is really unlike me because I'm very verbal. And I said, hey, hello, hello, what am I gonna play? And Patty said, well, you're gonna play bass. I said, okay, okay. So I went to my dad and I said, uh, we're starting a band, dad. And do you have a bass guitar? So amongst all these millions of instruments that, that he has, he had a bass guitar. And I don't know if any of you listening know anything about basses, but there is a Rolls Royce of bass guitars. It's, it's the best. It's the heaviest. It's the biggest. And it's the best. And I got given, I had no idea, a Fender Precision 1957, which is like the Rolls Royce. And uh, the long neck, I didn't even know that there was uh, a choice of smaller necks or lighter. I didn't know. All I knew was I asked my dad for a bass and that's what I got. So that's what I learned. So consequently, learning on the best and the hardest bass to master, I became a good bass player. And let's address that right now. People often say to me, they say even still now, how the hell do you play bass and sing lead? Well, first of all, I play drums. So you can think with different parts. Then I played piano. You're thinking of two hands already. And when I learned the bass, I didn't just realize this time. I was just thinking about it. At the same time I was learning the bass, I was becoming lead singer. So they went together and I did never think about separating one from the other. So pleasure seekers went on the road, 14, did one more year of school, went on the road again. We played all the time. We played all the clubs. Um, because we were girls, we got all the gigs because we were the unusual thing. And um, at 15, I was in New York playing New York my first time. And I remember phoning my dad, pivotal moments this is. And uh, my mom got on the phone and I said, uh, dad, really important. I said, um, sitting on the bed. I said, I think I found what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I don't want to come back and finish school. So there was a big silence. My dad was very clever. And he said very quietly, and he's not a quiet man. He said, he said, Susie, is there anything I can say to change your mind? And I said, no. So he quietly put the phone down. <laughs> Do you know, I went, it was like, it was like he had quietly, non angrily cut my lifeline. So that, that was good. That gave me that pause. You know, I'm only 50 and I went, Jeez, is this what I wanted? Oh my, is this? And yes, it was. So off we went. I was the main front person. I did 98% of the songs, playing, singing. Um, I learned, I have to say, I learned my craft between 64 and 69, doing five shows a night, normal, five shows a night, 45 on, 15 minutes off. You learned how to use your voice so you could sing five shows a night. You learned how to banter with the jerks that had had a drink. You know, you learned how to, you how to pace yourself. You learned everything in that time. Um, so I then, then we played at a festival, 1969 in Detroit. And because we were a show band, which we had become a show band with nice outfits and show band. And I, I always had a top hat, but we would trade instruments to do Motown dance steps and all. Anyway, we played a, a hippie festival in 69 and the world had changed while we were cocooned in Clubland. So we kind of died. And it was like, what? 
you know, doing our best show that was really went down great. And then we decided, or they decided, the rest of the girls to change the entire structure of the band. They would push me and my light. I have to say that because it's a recurring theme in my life or what I preach. They, they said I would go to the back and only do a few songs and mainly play the bass and a little bit of keyboards. And my little sister would join the band and become lead singer because she was of that sort of more jamming generation and she would infuse new, new feeling into the band. And they also said we would then start um, writing our own material. So that was from 69 to 71. Wasn't very happy in that band whatsoever. Um, I didn't like being at the back, but what it did do, it allowed me to become excellent on my bass because I wasn't up front anymore. So I could just, I back jamming and I really started to learn really good jamming methods. And um, by the time I got discovered, which is coming next, I become a really good bass player and a good front woman. So then they all came together. So we're in 1971. I'm not happy in the band. They've got me at the back, not a good place to put me. And Electra Records comes to see the band. They don't like Cradle at all. And they offered me a solo contract. I only did two songs all night. This is what this shows you is you can't hide a light. You can't, I say it to people. If you got the light, it will shine. No matter what, it will shine out. Same week, Mickey Mouse came over from England with Jeff Beck and Cozy Powell to record at Motown. He saw the band, didn't want the band, wanted me. So obviously, boom, 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 my time to go. I always knew, always felt I would get a tap on the shoulder one day. Then I had the decision, go to New York and become the next Janis Joplin. No, thank you. Go to England and become the first Susie Quattro. So I went to England. Uh, big decision, left my home, left my family, left my band, left everything, everything, a comfortable existence, took my little base, my suitcase, my big base in my suitcase and came to London. And then about a year and a half went by. Mickey recorded me many times, many different stuff. Um, he could never capture me on record. He he, he, he knew what I wasn't, he knew I was unique. He kept saying that unique, but he couldn't, couldn't find it with me. Just couldn't find it. Just me have a sip of water. And uh, I was in going a little bit stir crazy, crying myself to sleep every night, being lonely, but never even thinking for a millisecond to go home. I came to do something and I was gonna do it, done. Very determined girl. I then said to Mickey, I need a band. That's it, need a band. So I advertised in Melody Maker, got my band together, and it was a good band, and we were doing all my own songs. So I had a style, had a band. We went on the first ever tour. Mickey put us on with myself at the front. Nobody knew me yet. Uh, I had 15 minutes. Then Thin Lizzy, then Slade. So we did the first national tour of the UK. Um, and at that point, Mickey had just signed Chin and Chapman. And when we got back from the tour, the band was together. And Mickey said, would you mind if Mike comes and sees you, play your set and maybe can write you that three minute elusive hit single. So I said, not at all, no problem. So the whole set was boogie. That's what I was writing. And Mike went away and clever wrote can the can bang hits. I'm bringing you up to date now, 1973, had my first number one. I was just 23 in June, started touring all over the world, had the image, the image is good. Um, when Can the Can was recorded, Mickey heard it and he said, uh, you know, Susie, this is going to be a number one. And he was right, but he knew his stuff, you know, he's a smart guy. So he, he said to me, meeting time, meeting time, Miss Quattro, <laughs> Miss Susie Quattro he used to call me. He said, okay, so what do you want to wear? Now it's the image. And I said, I want to wear leather. And he said, no. And I said, yes. And he said, no. And he said, it's old fashioned. And I said, I don't care. Cause I had Elvis in my mind from the comeback special. So finally, Mickey said, yes, okay, you can wear leather. And then he said, what about a jumpsuit? And I'm kind of like a non, I, I could be quite naive. I'm a non-feminine makeup sexiness. I was more like a tomboy. So I thought that the jumpsuit was sensible, that I could jump around on stage and everything would stay in one place. No idea it was going to be sexy. I didn't know until I got the pictures back and I went, oh my goodness me. I didn't even have hardly any makeup on for that. And um, so th this was pivotal moment. 
I'm standing in the studio with Gerard Mankiewicz, who's a very known photographer, and he's taken pictures of me right up until the present day. I'm standing there in my first leather jumpsuit. The boys in the band are draped around my feet. My record is playing on the speakers. The camera's here. And Gerard said to me, right, now give me that Susie Quattro look. I didn't know I had one. And I did this. That's, that's it. But I didn't know I had it. And it was just pivotal. As soon as he said that to me, I went, yeah, I know what that is. <laughs> so I don't want to talk for too long here, take up too much of your time. So um, I toured, 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 but going back to my childhood, knowing that I had these different elements in me, even though I love the leather jumpsuit and I love the rock and roll, I never wanted to be boxed in to anything, never boxed in. So I, I knew that if opportunities came along, I would take them as they came. Happy Days came along in 1977. And I went over there, auditioned, got the part, three seasons. Great part. Um, then we started having lots of hits. Again, went back on the road. Then in the 80s, I had two kids. So that took up two years of my life. And in between the two kids, I toured. And then I decided I wanted to spread my wings again. I did Annie Get Your Gun in the West End, which was fantastic. Oh, loved it. Um, then I had my own talk show in 89. Then 91, I wrote a musical, which the piano, I always say the piano lessons that I had were invaluable when I wrote my musical. Oh, fantastic. Um, I wrote about Tallulah Bankhead, Tallulah Who the show was called. Me and Shirley Roden did the music and I starred as Tallulah and Willie Rushton did the book. Uh, let me see now, 91 was a difficult year. 92, I got divorced. 93, got remarried, whirlwind romance. Dove back into my music. We're coming up more present day now. Um, I started to really, really get back into what I was doing. 99, I started radio on BBC Radio 2, 15 years. Um, then I was also did... This is your life. I was the subject of this is your life, which I honestly didn't know about. Let me see what are we up to now. Then finally in 2006, I wrote my first book. Don't box me in that one. Unzipped. Every, everything in it is written by me. I didn't let them add one phrase. I did that. Then um, I put out back to the drive. Great, great received critically. Then let me see 2011. I did my first felt album with Mike Chapman again in about 10, 15 years. I'm still touring. I'm touring. I'm touring all the time. 2017, I did an album with um, Andy Scott, lead guitarist from The Suite, and Don Powell, original drummer from Slade. We called it QSP. That charted. Um, also, that same year, I did my 35th tour of Australia. I'm now about to do my 38th, but on this tour, the reason I'm mentioning it is because we had QSP as my support group. So I supported me. I did 37 songs a night singing. That's incredible. Is that too much light coming in? Should I close that curtain a bit or are you okay? Okay. All right. So um, now we're up to two, oh no, 216. I have to remember you made me honorary doctor of music. And I couldn't believe that I was standing on that stage having not graduated high school and I was honorary doctor of music. I mean, how crazy is that? How crazy is that? All right. So we're now up to 218. Um, I've written a poetry book in the meantime, a coffee, say, a coffee table poetry book called Through My, Through My Eyes, which I'm very proud of. I've been doing this since a little girl. I'm really a words person. So that got put out. Fantastic. My second book. Um, and I also put out The Hurricane, my novel, my first novel. I'm working on my second one now. Uh, 218. We're up to there now. Yeah. So my son came to me and he had come to me a few times before, but he said, mom, I need to write with you. He's a fine guitar player, but he was always in bands and, you know, doing what kids do. And then he said, I need to write with you now. So meant he was ready. So we went in the studio and started to make some demos. He showed me what he had, a few riffs. And I said, yeah, I can work with that. And I could work with it. And he surprised me because he was pretty damn good. And we went in to make demos, just three demos, three songs we had written together. And uh, all of a sudden I said, we are, we're making an album. 
And he said, I know. I said, how did this happen? I was so surprised that it happened. And um, real uh, moment for him. People are asking me, do I find it hard to work with family? Well, as my history shows you, I mean, his father was my guitar player and I worked with family my whole life. So no, it's not. But it was funny for him. And we were sitting there recording on the first session together. And I'm sitting here and he's over with his guitar and I got a scratch mark up and we're playing away. First song. And he went, he stopped. I said, what's the matter? He said, oh my God. I said, what? He said, all of a sudden, I'm in the studio with Susie Quattro. And I just, really, a moment. And I looked at him and I just went, and? And he went, nothing. Keep going. So he had to step up to bat or leave. And he had to do that. And this album was so, no control is called, just, just brilliant, brilliantly critical acclaimed all over the world. Um, and so... After that came nonstop tours. I'm now on tour about 38. Okay, then end of 219. 219 was one of my highest years. No Control came out with my son. My documentary, Suzy Q, came out at the end of the year. Sat at the top of the Amazon charts for a long time. It's, it's, if, you can't get it, if you get a chance to see it, do it. It's been on Sky Arts, but it's real um, warts and all. I told the guy that if he wanted a documentary of people going, oh, she's wonderful. He's speaking to the wrong girl because I wanted it to tell my struggles and my story. And it does. And now we're kind of up to present day 2020 lockdown. I had 95 shows in the book. Susie turned 70. Huge, huge. It was going to be Richard was on the road with his band. Done. So luckily, just before lockdown, I built a little demo studio in my grounds. Luckily. And uh, the company took, took up the option for the next album. So I said to Richard, OK, lockdown's here. Let's not get crazy about it. We now have time to write this album. So we started to write this album. Um, he worked in the studio. I worked on the patio because I'm not a button pusher. You know, I'm more old fashioned. I just like my iPad with press record. That's all. And play either acoustic bass or acoustic guitar with my songbook. That's how I'm happy. So this album is now it's charting charting everywhere, the devil and me, all over the world. And people are now calling us the dream team of songwriters. So how this happened from him saying, mom, I want to show you a few riffs to now. It's amazing. And, and before I stop and go into whatever you want to do, what he's done is on this album, because he got his confidence up on the first album, but he got his confidence almost too much. I mean, we had a few moments, you know, but he said to me, I know exactly what you should be doing, Mom. You have to trust me on this album. It hasn't got the right vibe. It's not on the album. I, you know, part of me is going, who do you think you are? You know, but um, I started to trust him very, very quickly. And what's happened on this album, everybody's raving, is because we created a, a perfect storm without meaning to. He brought his 36 years of age. Oh, he's 36 years of age. His, um, in his DNA is... All his life, as long as back as he can remember, he has watched me perform. So he has in his DNA what Susie, who Susie Quattro is. And I could, I, I'm now seeing what happened to this. I'm seeing myself through his eyes, which is amazing. So I gave birth to him and he's given rebirth to me. And just before I stop, just to bring you up to date, I also created and released a coffee table lyric book called Through My Words, all during lockdown. I've now finished my fifth book. It's ready to go to the publishers and I'm working on my sixth novel and I'm writing for the next album. And other than that, I'm not very busy. <laughs> I'm all done now. That's it. <laughs> Are you guys there? Yeah. Thank you. I lost the main picture here, but I can see all you guys. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, Susie. I'm back. I'm, I'm, I've been unmuted now. <laughs> okay. So is that okay? Did that's I? I wanted, yeah, good. I did. I did the Susie Quattro story, but that's, that's what great. we wanted. Yeah, yeah. That's what we wanted. That's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's you, you know, you talked about your your career. I mean, it's a really uh, illustrious career, and uh, you you're still busy, you're still doing things. I did actually have a few questions I wanted to ask you if if, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, Let me close this curtain just a teeny bit because the sunlight's in my eyes. One sec. Okay. Oh, that's better. Okay, here we go. That's better. 
So you mentioned earlier about Elvis Presley being an influence, but were there any other uh, musical influences you had? Sure, sure. And in fact, the lucky thing is, I don't know how many people can relate to this, but when you're in a musical family and you're aware of it, you actually take on everything. I took on all my dad's stuff, you know? I, I'm quite big on jazz, like Billie Holiday and all that era, 20s, 30s, 40s. And then by the time it got to the 50s, I was listening to my elder sister's music and then the next brother and then the sister. So you get everything. But once I started to perform, it was Elvis for sure. Then Otis Redding, I, I called myself Susie Soul. And um, Bob Dylan for lyric writing, big, big influence on me. And for singing, Billie Holiday, I know that sounds nuts, but when you hear the new album, there's a track on there called Love's Gone Bad and I have channeled my Billie Holiday. And it's the way she sits behind the beat and you think she's not gonna catch up, it's great. And bass, I have two heroes, Jamerson from Motown in the early 60s, just the business. Mm -hmm. And um, I also like the, the bass player from Can Heat very much. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, what are your all time favorite songs, Susie? Mm. Enriched, do you mean my own or in which genre you have to play? Um, it could be any genre, it can be your own or it can be others. It, it, well, I, I won't talk about my own. I'll talk about my favorite songs. Uh, the first one that always comes to mind is When I Fall in Love, because I think that that song encapsulates every emotion that you're supposed to go through in this life by Nat King Cole. I just love it. Yes. Um, the song that really turned me on to what a lyric could create is Bob Dylan, Blown in the Wind. I actually cry when I, when I hear that song, just from what it says, just cry. And third, what's the third one? Let me think for a minute. Oh my God. Well, gotta be Love Me Tender. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be that. I mean, I, because it has a memory for me. I remember my father coming home from work. You know, he'd come in, he'd put his coat down, have dinner, and then go out and play music. But he came and put his shoes down, put his coat down, and he had a, he had a little record with him, one of those big ones, what do you call it, 78. Mm -hmm. And he went whack and threw it on the table, on the hallway table. And I went, what's he doing? He went, oh, okay, okay, so the kid can sing. And it was so stressly on me. Okay, so the kid can sing. Excellent. <laughs> um, which of your albums mean more to you and and uh, and why obviously the first one that's a that's a moment when you create your first bit of art um i'd say susie and other four letter words midstream i don't know why even mike chapman said boy you want a good wave of songwriting here so it was a good collection of my songs um QSP because it was the it was a super group so that was great but mm -hmm. I'd say that definitely no control and the devil in me from what I've been able to attain with my son it's the icing on the cake to have this kind of relationship you know mm -hmm. and and to see him blossom it's fantastic you know so they, they mean a lot to me both albums mm -hmm. because I didn't see it coming he really did hide himself <laughs> until he finally said that to me I need to write with you now I said okay okay that's great <laughs> Um, my other question was, uh, why do you still feel the need to tour? Well, it's not for the money. I'm comfortable to the day I die. I have been for many years. Um, I need to tour because it's the air I breathe. I was born, I was born to entertain and that's how I feel deep down. And I love the whole process. Standing there wondering if they're going to like you going across the footlights, taking everybody on the journey and leaving them swinging from the rafters and walking out the door with a smile on their face. That to me completes my artistic cycle. Sure. I mean, when you first got into the business, was it what you expected? Was, was you know, your experience in the early days? You mean when I was 14? No, I mean, a little later on when you, when you became well, later on. successful. You mean when I got here and started to be successful? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I'd done my homework, been on the road, you know, from 14 till 23 when I had my first hit. So I, I knew what the business was. Mm -hmm. I'd seen enough idiots, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I have really good instincts, really good. I, I, I like to call it my bullshit detector. 
and they go and um the only the only big mistakes i've ever made in my life has been when, when i've ignored that instinct so i'm pretty good i'm pretty straight i'm pretty square um and i'm very 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 honest and i think i have attracted like-minded people for the most part mm -hmm. so and it didn't you know i have a quick mouth but you have to as you're growing up in the club. So you have to be able to handle the banter with the drunks at the bar. and all. So I learned that very early. So I can take care of myself, you know, and tough, but thin skin that it's a real dichotomy how those two come together, you know? We lost you for a minute there, Susie. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It does that sometimes. You know, it just happens on Zoom sometimes. We're That's back. Okay. okay. Um, the other question I was going to ask, do you think it is more difficult today to become successful in the music business than it was when you were starting out? I think the attitude is different. I think what I don't like about it is that because of um, things like the reality shows, which let me put down for the record, I do watch because they're entertaining. I'm not going to bullshit and say I don't watch it. Sure, I do. But I don't think they've had a good effect. And I think what's happened is it's bred a whole generation of would-be singers and musicians who get in the business to become famous. And that's not the right idea. I didn't get into the business to become famous. I got into business because I did not have a choice. I had to do it. It's a whole different attitude there, you know, and um, I just don't think it's healthy, you know, and, and when you look back sometimes and you say, okay, who won this year, this year, who won, you don't even know their name anymore, which mm -hmm. proves my point. So it's not the healthiest thing. Um, it's also much more business. You know, you used to make your money by making records and selling them. And now you don't because now nobody wants to pay for music anymore, really. So the up and coming musicians, their, their stuff is streamed and they get paid peanuts. Yeah. So it's a whole different thing that way. That's why record companies are now trying to get parts of the tours of the groups, which is even funnier because it's just like this COVID is almost a revenge on that system because there are no tours. So maybe that's nature's way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, what are you going to get? Um, but it has changed and you do have to roll with the punches. You do have to roll with it. What else can you do? You can't change it, you know? Thank you, Susie. Um, I, I can see that some of our audience are quite anxious to get, uh, to ask some questions. So I'm just going to go into the chat for a minute here and uh, okay. have a look through these questions. Oh, um, somebody's asking if you speak any Hungarian. Only rude words. Only rude words. <laughs> rude words. But um, my mother spoke fluent Hungarian. Right. It's, you know, you can't get your head around that language. That's a really difficult language. And mm -hmm. I don't speak Italian either. My dad didn't speak Italian, but my, my, my grandpa, he talked like a dot, you know, even though he's there from nine. Suzanne, I know you shut up. <laughs> Um, oh, another question here. Um, this is from Michelle Reynolds. You mentioned warts and all, many musicians succeed and grow out of adversity. What has been the most influential early experiences that have formed you? So many of them. Jeez. Um, there was, uh, but, but what I'll just do what came to mind. Um, I told me I wanted a band and, he, and I got one and he put me on at the rainbow, you know, just shoved me on this gig with no roadie, no road crew or anything, just me. And it was just a trio. And uh, after me, you know, telling him I really needed to work live and everything. So we were thrown a, as a support last minute and there was an all girl band after me and the Kinks were headlining and it was at the rainbow. And as I went to go up on stage to do my little bit, the amp blew up <laughs> and I had no road crew. So I had to stop playing and go back there and try to fix my own amp in the middle of the show. So the guitar player just took over the show and he started doing his own songs. So for 15 minutes, I couldn't get it working. And finally I went into the dressing room, packed my bass and went home to my hotel room to a really angry phone call from Mickey Most who said I had humiliated him. <laughs> so things like this, 
it was that was a turning point for me where I went right I don't put up with this anymore I didn't say anything I just went right I became real tough then real tough I didn't take it again but and then Mickey knew it was bad because years later we were always close he said to me oh Susie that was character building I believe that was his apology character building <laughs> tell me another one <laughs> I have another one here from uh, Richard Doe. He, he asks if you ever played with Jimi Hendrix. Oh, I have a very funny Hendrix story. Oh my God. You tell. Oh my God. My, my brother was a promoter for a while and he promoted him many times. And one time my brother's limousine broke down. So he sent my dad in his Cadillac to the airport instead to pick him up, which my dad did. Now my dad is quite square. So there's this guy with this electric hair in the back seat, smoking a joint. <laughs> and my dad, my dad was in the car going, God damn it, God damn it, I don't want to be, doing, God damn it. <laughs> so I don't think he was a fan. And I remember him saying, when he, when he saw him and he was doing his feedback stuff, and my dad said, and you call that, you call that guitar playing that feedback? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's great though. I, I've never seen anybody quite like him before. Not, not before and not since. He was unique. He takes that, you know, takes that with him. That's his legacy. Thank you, Susie. We, uh, another question here um, from Wavy Dave Colin Costello. He, he says, um, you said your son had that, oh my, in, in quotations here, oh my God, I'm working with Susie Quattro moment. Who have you worked with in your career that made you feel the same way? I'm trying to think if there is anybody. I always, I, I was a little bit different. I always had the kind of thing that I was meeting a colleague, somebody in my profession. So I was never starstruck as such. I mean, I'm fans of lots of people, but never that I go like that, trying to think. I don't know, the only one that just came to mind was James Burton, you know, Elvis's guitar player. And he did my Elvis tribute, Singing with Angels. I wrote it and you can Google it. It's a wonderful song. And I had him and the Jordanaires original backing group in, yeah. in Elvis's yeah. studio. And um, I was in awe that I was playing with one of Elvis's people and he loved the song and we're in the studio. And uh, here's a moment for me. We were taking a little break from the song and you know I'm, I'm in there with the Jordanaires and James Burton recording my tribute song that I've written to Elvis. I mean, how beautiful is that? And I was playing James a bit of my uh, new album on his headphones. And I'll never forget this. He took the headphones off and he went, Susie, you have what Elvis had. And I went, oh, what? I, I didn't even care if he was lying. I said, you said, but I, I mean, can you imagine? I went, what, what do you mean? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the only way I can explain it is everything you do is you. Do you get that? I'm not sure I get it yet, but, but it, what, what a compliment though but what a compliment, but I've never been in awe. Oh, I know one time I was in awe. I did a um, TV show, a charity show for Prince Charles charity, very you know, topical to talk about this now. And, you know, so it's a charity show. So I'm out of my comfort zone. I'm in this little waspy outfit with fishnet tights and things. And I'm singing, uh, you made me love you. You didn't want to do it to a parrot you know, a choreographed thing. And so I've got, you know, and I've got quite good legs and um, cause I just don't show them, but I do have nice legs. And so we're at the, at the lineup at the end and everybody, the whole cast is lined up and the camera crew is coming along and filming Prince Charles meeting everybody, shaking all the performers hands. And he gets to me, I mean, I don't curtsy, I'm American and I'm not quite sure what I'm gonna say, but I just, you know, rolled with it. And he said, um, was that difficult to do? And I said, well, I said, I had to do a tap dance and I've never tapped before in my life. And he said, it was excellent. I said, thank you very much. And he walked on and he got about three people down and he stage whispered back. So the cameras got the whole thing. And you have the best legs since Tina Turner. <laughs> and here's what I did on camera. It's on camera. I went, <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> I completely lost control. I acted like a gibbering idiot. And the reason is you don't expect Prince Charles to say that to you, do you? 
I could have handled any of the comment, but that I just and on the credits on the show, they show me going all bright red in the face, you know. Oh, brilliant it was. Brilliant. I had no comeback, just total shy, you know. Thanks, Susie. Another question here. Is there anyone you'd like to work with but have not yet had uh, had a chance to? I keep getting asked this question lately, and for some reason, I keep saying Rod Stewart, and I don't know why. Maybe, maybe, I mean, everybody's Southern on the Nora, I'm just singing the best I've ever sung. Maybe I feel like I'd like that challenge to do something with him. You know, I think I would. Um, who else? Can't think of anybody else. A lot of, most of the people I want to work with are gone. All my heroes, you know. I've done an album with KT Tunstall. Um, it's now at the studio waiting to be mixed. Um, I'm not sure when that will come out, but we've, we met, we got along, we did this and we created something between her and me. And uh, it's gonna be, it's, it's just really good. So I worked with her, um, who else? No, all my favorite people are gone. Would have loved to have done something with Billie Holiday. Elvis, oh God, Paul. Oh. Hmm. I did do the big Elvis, um, big huge concert in Hyde Hall. Uh, not uh, in at uh, Hyde Park. And um, I was the only one to play with the TCB band. So we rocked the joint. James came up to me halfway through, sh halfway through the show and he went, he said to me, Susie, when we got there, would you please kick some ass? I said, yeah, okay. So it was, there was a lot of ballads and he said, can we do it? And he had a big grin on his face. So yeah, Elvis, I would have loved to have worked. Oh, brilliant. That's great. Um, it's a question from Sophie J. Um, she says, I grew up in Australia and you were certainly big there through my growing up. Is it your biggest territory? It's certainly one of my biggest territories and one of, one of my most constant. I'm about to do my 38th tour this, so yeah. Um, Australia, we had a real affinity right from, right from the start. Um, and everybody always asks me, I don't know. I like to think it's because Australians are very much no nonsense people. What you see is what you get. And I'm exactly the same. What you see is what you get. Uh, Japan, I was always huge in. Um, but yeah, Australia is one of my biggest. They, I go there at least once every year and a half. Yeah, it's my second home. Um, another question from Stuart. Is there anything especially positive that you have been able to take from this pandemic that you have been able to channel into your work? You kind of answered that earlier on, but if you'd like to elaborate on that. Yes. In fact, my next book that I just finished is called Through My Thoughts. It's another illustrated coffee table book. And as soon as the pandemic started, I thought, what can I do? Not to get paid for anything, but just to do what I do and uplift and entertain. So I tried to find out what I could do. I did um, 50 bass lines, which was a lot of hard work, you know, and people kept requesting songs I hadn't played since 1973. <laughs> Thank God. Anyway, 50 of those. I did um, Susie Sunday specials where I stripped my songs back and played them on the piano. Um, I did my Instagram daily from March 21st. So that was a photo and Susie's thought for the day. And I tried to make it philosophical and uplifting. Um, and I did my Facebook sites and when I, I, I was just typing up this through my thoughts, because I've, I've used my Instagram for the year, March 21st to March 21st as my example. And what I realized was, wow, the moods that you go through, that we've all gone through, you know, um, it's important that you acknowledge those moods. It's important that you really prioritize you know, that's what this pandemic has done. Is this person who's upsetting me, are they important or are they not? You know, who do I waste this emotion on? And sometimes it is wasted emotion. It is, it can be. Who am I getting angry with that I should not be getting angry with? You do prioritize, you do whittle things down. And it's also, I, I one time, I just tell the story because it illustrates it. Because I do this first thing in the morning, I come down, Instagram, Facebook. Media, my first fresh thoughts. And on Facebook this day, first thing in the morning, it's like about eight o'clock in the morning. And I wrote on there, good morning, everybody. Today I'm doing da 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 And by the way, just to let you know that this depression, depression, wherever you are, you're not getting in my door, so don't come knocking. Strange thing to write, right? I didn't think anything of it. And that night, midnight came. 
waterworks, I hit the wall as hard as you can hit a wall. I bashed into it. And this is what I shared the next day. And I just let myself cry. And I said to everybody, Big Mouth Susie, I won't say that again. Obviously, what had happened was I was feeling the depression and it was skirting around on the outside. And I was doing that without knowing it's subconscious. And then at night when your guard is down, you're ready to go to sleep. It went bang. So my message the next day was it, it doesn't matter if you hit the wall. I, I don't know anybody. I'm asking you too. You're looking at me. Have you hit the wall? Everybody's hit the wall. We just go and you're done, aren't you? You're done. You wonder what you're doing here. And everybody has felt this. And it's taught me that it's good to share these moments because people who have been hitting the wall, then they think, okay, it's not just me. Everybody's hitting the wall sometimes, you know? And also, you know, you, a couple of times, I just, it's never happened to me in my whole career. One time, one troll got on my official Facebook site. Why are you on there? You know, even why, why be on there? And I just was saying, oh, my husband just went home. First time I've seen him in four months. He was here for six days. It was allowed to come five COVID tests, da, 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 da. And we shared a nice bottle of wine. And, da, da. and this guy did a two and a half paragraph of why was I talking about not seeing my husband, people that lost people. And why talk about a wine that I was lucky to enjoy. And I went, what? I'm sharing what I did in my day with you. So I, I, I did it properly. I thought, okay, this guy obviously is having a hard time. So I didn't get mad at him. I just said, I'm sorry you took the post that way. You know, it was just me sharing my life and my, my losses and my aches and my pains are just as important to me as yours are to you. And I'm sorry that you feel that way. And uh, you obviously to let off, let off a bit of steam and I hope you feel better. And the next day he apologized online. So, I mean, I'm not about to start justifying my life to anybody. I'm not going to do that. But I did feel for him because I felt like he just was triggered, you know, by just me saying, what, so what? So I saw my husband once for six days, you know, since Christmas, he came up for his birthday at like cost him like maybe a thousand pounds and he had to take five different COVID tests. So, so that's a problem for some people. It shouldn't be. You know, I, I can hear everybody's problems and not go, oh, how dare you? That's not the right attitude anyway. But saying that, he did apologize. And I said, okay, fair enough. Thanks, Susie. Um, another question here from Glynis uh, Neslin. Um, she asks, which female musicians do you like uh, rate at present? At present? Right. KT Tunstall is a fine guitar player and she's pretty present uh who else is up I, I don't know anybody right now let me think oh there's a the the girl that my son works with i can never say her name right biba doobie fine guitars fine guitars uh going back a little bit bonnie Raitt, one of the finest slide players i've seen um lita four from the runaways good let me think now bertha they were a good band. I'm going for girls now, aren't I? Um, let me think. Who else? Yeah, then I, oh, Fanny. The original Fanny, they were excellent. The original group. Um, oh, Tina. Tina's in my documentary. Tina Weymouth, what a nice girl. I don't know how good she is on bass. I'd have to, I'd have to hear her. <laughs> um, yeah, so those are my today. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Um, will you ever, this is from Jill Razak, will you ever tour the US? Oh God, I want to. I didn't come back in the eighties. I was doing everything else, the musicals and having kids and touring everywhere else. And when you don't go back for a little while, you tend to maybe lose the market a little bit. Um, I did go to Canada about three years ago and did a sold out two night show there, 5,000 people. Fantastic gig. They always want me to come back to America and something gets in the way. I've been there several times to get awards lately. Um, I got the Michigan Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I got the Woman of Valor in Austin, Texas. And just last January, I got the She Rocks Icon Award. So I have been back. I would love to tour there. I'm hoping it will happen. And I always get asked that I want to come. It just needs to happen. <laughs> 
Uh, another one here from uh, Stuart. Any advice for women setting out to make their way through the music biz? Sure. How long you got? Um, <laughs> for women. This is for women, even though, women I don't yeah. do gender, even though I don't do gender. I will for the sake of this question. Um, first of all, for, in fact, we'll just tackle that right now. First of all, never think of yourself as a female musician. If you're a musician, just think of yourself as a musician. Same as if you're a singer, you're a singer. You don't need to qualify your sex to that, okay? But automatically, automatically you're making differences and there shouldn't be. An artist is an artist. Um, if you're a musician, learn your instrument, learn one properly and learn it properly. Don't ever play at being a musician. Be a musician. I'm, I'm dead serious about that, you know? And if you're a singer, learn how to sing. Believe in yourself. Be determined and know that you have to give up everything else to make it. That's a fact of life. I'm sorry, but it is. It's a total dedication, total focus. You have to give everything up. And the one biggest thing I say, if you're going to make it in rock and roll to any female, is, okay, I don't do gender. And okay, I can be one of the boys quite easily. But it doesn't mean ever I lose my femininity because I've never done you know, I can stand at the bar with you and tell a joke and swear, but I got a little invisible feminine card. It's in my back pocket. And if you step out of line, it comes out like a penalty card and you know it. You don't need to become unfeminine to be tough. That's what I'm trying to say. That's what I'm trying to say. But don't put up with any shit from anybody at any time. That's my message. Do not compromise yourself. Not for a millisecond. Am we allowed to swear on this? It doesn't matter. I've done it anyway. <laughs> they can ask that now. <laughs> uh, another question from Glynis Neslin. Uh, do you play double bass? I do. And in fact, they have a three-quarter one that's really nice. And I'm about to order one. I did one time go to a club with the jazz trio. And me being me, I wanted to jam. And the big guy said to me, you can't even reach. And I said, give me a chair. And I stood on the chair and I jammed. One of my most embarrassing moments, but I did it. I did <laughs> move over. So it was a time um, we were supporting Santana in Cradle and because I play bongos and also congos. And I, I was watching their show and I couldn't stand it. And I just went on stage in the middle of their show and I knocked the congo player off the set. And he looked at Carlos and Carlos went, and I started to play. <laughs> I can't believe I did that. He like went, what's wrong with you? He said, let her go. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Must have been fun. Yeah, embarrassing. Oh, that's great. Um, what made you, uh, sorry, this question's from uh, RLL1, the name's not here. What made you want to settle in the UK? And what was there anything particular that made you settle on Essex? Well, I never thought I was gonna settle here. I had a three month visit and I had a plane ticket back. Uh, Mickey was gonna bring me over. She's answering a question for me. What's that? Oh, for you, there you are, okay. So um, I had a three month, I had three month flight, three month back, I'm supposed to make an album, go back to America. Uh, Mickey, Mickey is, a, he, bless him. He would be the first to say he knew what I wasn't. He didn't know what I was. Didn't, so he didn't know how to record me. So time went on, time went on, time went on. I got more used to it here, got more used to it. Then I formed the band and then I fell in love with my guitar player. So again, more roots coming down. And my, my guitar player, which is Richard's dad, uh, he was raised in Essex, in Romford. So when it came time to buy, buy a home, we wanted to be near one of the sets of parents and we decided to move near Romford to be near one of the sets. So it just happened. Then I moved here in 1980 and I've, this is my home, but Detroit is my heart, if that makes sense. So everything was just a series of rolling on and rolling on. I never planned to stay in England my whole life, but I have my American passport and I am the Detroit, I'm the girl from Detroit city in Essex. <laughs> uh, another question from Michael. What are your memories of playing Madison Square Garden where I first saw you opening to Grand Funk 1974? Um, oh my God. Must have been what? thrilling playing with other Detroit heroes. And what are your other favorite Detroit rockers? Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Amazing. Um, this is one of my favorite stories. We, we went brilliant. 
brilliant on that gig, right? Madison Square Gardens, excuse me. So I ran off right after the set to change into my gold leather suit for the encore, okay? Quick, 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 you know, the drum, they're doing whatever they do while you quickly change. I look thing there at the side of the stage to change into. And then I'm waiting at the bottom of the stairs, ready to go up. And as I'm out ready to go onto the stage, there was complete silence. And I went, what? What's going on? And the the, the manager he, he, of, of, of that tour, he went, come here. I'm going, did I die? Did I die a death? And he went, come here. And he put me up to the top so they couldn't see me. The entire Madison Square Gardens was a candle encore. I nearly died. There's me thinking I had completely blown it. And they're all standing there quietly like this. What a moment that was. Um, read Detroit bands. We grew up all together. Um, MC5, wonderful. Mitch Ryder, wonderful. Iggy, I knew him when he was a drummer. Um, who else is there? There's a Grand Funk Railroad. Alice is one of my good friends since I've been 15. Uh, God, White Stripes, I don't know them, but they cite me as an influence. Kid Rock, excellent. Eminem, excellent. And then you got Motown. I mean, Detroit is, is one of the best musical cities in the world. I have to say that for the diversity. And also because Detroit, you have this, uh, and we've had this discussion so many times, all us Detroit people, you know, you have uh, an electricity. It's a dangerous electric. It's like a current breaker all the time, circuit breaker. And you got the black and the white, the rich and the poor, the Motown, this, that, and it's all, it's all like this. And there's an energy level there that if you're from Detroit, Alice and I've talked about this. If you're from Detroit, you cannot get rid of it. It's in your DNA. He says that in my documentary, it's in the DNA. You can take the girl out of Detroit. You can take the person out of Detroit, but you can't take Detroit out of the person. You just can't. Thank you. Um, another question here from Tom Ryan. I knew you had a, a very career, but was not expecting to hear you mention Willie Rushton. Could you tell us a bit more about that show? Sure. I'd met Willie really a few times. I really liked him. He's such a funny man. And um, I'd written the music and lyrics to a show that I wanted to do about Tallulah Bankhead. And I didn't have a book for it. I just was going through her biography, reading. I really loved her. And I was writing the songs. And I took the songs to him. And he said, wow, great. I said, will you write the book? And he said, yes. So he wrote the book called Tallulah Who. And uh, I played Tallulah. And I played it at the Queen's Theater in Hornchurch. And wow, to see your name on the marquee, Words in Music by Susie Quattro and Shirley Roden, Tallulah Who, starring Susie Quattro as Tallulah Bankhead. What an artistic moment that was. Wow. But that's how I know him anyway. Lovely man. Very funny. Very, very funny. Uh, another question from Carol. Are you spiritual? Ridiculously so. Um, you know, it's something that people don't like to talk about because they think you're a weirdo. I'm not. My channels are very, very open. I've always been. And I'm sure her asking that question, she knows the answer already because she wouldn't have asked that question, so she knows I am. Um, I have very open channels all the time, all the time. I have the ability to meet somebody, and within five minutes or so, I can tell you about your whole life. And it's quite unsettling for some people, but I can read very well, and I am very spiritual. I actually did a spiritual album with Shirley Roden called Free the Butterfly. And I did uh, two Festival of Mind, Body, and Spirits where I gave talks and did stuff like this. Yeah, I am very spiritual. Absolutely. Um, Marion asks, have you got any bass tutorial lessons we can learn from? Sure. You have to go on YouTube. They're all available on one of my sites. Uh, Suzy Quattro's Bass Lines. There's 50 of them. And I take you through loads of different ways. I play different songs. And they're yeah, sure. They're all there, 50. That was a lot of hard work. I took about two hours to do one song because it had to be a little bit instructive, show you how I did the riff, stop the tape, sing a little bit, show you this, how it fits in singing and playing. So yes, they're online. You can, you can view them. They're available. Thank you. Um, okay, the last two questions I have here. Um, how has the shift to streaming uh, affected your experience in the music industry? Um, like I said earlier, it's 
Although I personally do not need the money. It, it's not very nice when um, no, nobody wants to pay for the music anymore. And really that's your craft. You're creating some music, somebody buys it and that's how it goes. And now they're doing stream, streaming and downloads. And unfortunately the business has not caught up in fairness on that. And I believe Ed Sheeran has been very verbal, Ed Sheeran has been very verbal on this. Um, the, the companies are taking most of the profit and giving the artists for streaming and downloads peanuts, which is very bad, especially for the young people starting out, you know, um, it's changed. And this needs to, I feel like this needs to adjust. I've adjusted to it that this is how it goes, but the payment needs to be adjusted because it's just plain not fair. That's all. I agree. Um, this message comes from Switzerland from Malcolm Craven, who says, uh, which, which was your worst gig and which was the most memorable? Worst gig. I think that would have been, <laughs> there was one gig I did that I shouldn't have done where I was very ill and I had to go over to the side of the stage and be ill in a bucket and then go back on and play. That was one of my worst memories. And the good thing about it was I never missed a note. Most, I have so many memorable, I can't. Okay, I got a couple though, I say two. When I turned 50 in Berlin and I played the Val Bruno and I played in front of 22,000 people to celebrate my 50th birthday, pretty special. And then bringing it up to date, New Year's Eve 2019, I played for 14,000 people. Fantastic, fantastic. And the one coming up that's gonna be great is 2022, April 20th. I have to do this, I have to do this. The Queen of Rock and Roll is playing the Royal Albert Hall. And you'll see this turning to this. <laughs> Can I ask you one more question from, is that okay? Uh, Sue Rogers has just posted one. It says, does Susie remember playing Royal Standard Pub in Walthamstow, East London, mid nineties? Does a bear shit in the woods? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It was one of my favorite gigs. Uh, we did it several times. It was that in your face club, you know, and everybody's here and the band is jammed together. We used it many times as a warm up gig before a tour. And one of my favorite gigs, great atmosphere. It's now closed. I wish it was open. I would play there again anytime. Fantastic gig. That's great. Thank you, Susie. Um, should I open it up to, just to check if we've got any more questions? Okay. Uh, anyone online with their cameras on like to ask a question straight up? Okay, I just wanted to double check. I didn't want to leave anyone out there. Um, well, Susie, it's been a, a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, you know, this, your experience in the industry and all those wonderful things that have happened for you. Um, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everybody who took part. Thank you all. Waving. Hang on. I got to do that's my wave. That's the royal wave. And that's okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.